Well, today we have a guest speaker. His name is Dr. John Cosgrove. Um, he was raised in Michigan. His dad was a Michigan State Police Officer and his mom was a housewife. He's a father of two daughters and he has six grandchildren. He lives in Ottawa, Tennessee currently with his wife, Trish, who is down here. Welcome, Trish. Um, after high school, he attended the United States Military Academy at West Point. He earned a master's degree from the University of Wisconsin. He received a PhD in leadership from Andrews, Andrews University. After graduating from West Point, he was commissioned as an officer in the Army and attained the rank of major. He commanded a company in the Presidential Honor Guard. He was an Airborne Ranger Infantry Officer. He was an honor graduate from the U.S. Army Ranger School, arguably the most difficult school in the armed forces. And he did all of this in 11, 11 years of service. So thank you for your service, Dr. Cosgrove. After the service, he became a financial advisor for Merrill Lynch. Then he was promoted to regional manager of the Central United States, headquartered right here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Then he became the president of Mellon Bank. Then he became the senior vice president of UBS. And now he's founded a leadership workshop and First Asset Financial. Today, Dr. Crossgrove travels the world speaking on value-based leadership. He moderates leadership workshops around the world, and he manages investments for his friends. I'd like to know what he does in his spare time. It is my privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Cosgrove to Collegedale Community Church. Let's give him a round of applause. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. I, I look out in this group and I see uh, such wonderful, familiar faces. I feel like uh, I'm at home. Uh, and it is truly an honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I give these speeches and give these talks, oftentimes it has to do with financial reasons, money. And, 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 and you know, I, invariably I get this question. Um, how much interest should I get if I invest in the stock market? How much money should I earn? And I soundly say 15% is what you should earn. You know, this year is probably a little bit more. Last year, probably a little less. But on average, 15%. But of course, on average, if you're standing in a pot of boiling water and your head is in the freezer, on average, you should feel great. And that's kind of the way this is. Jerry asked me some, quite some time ago if I would mind giving, giving a talk on money, on finances, from the pulpit. Um, it's, it's ironic it's during this time of year. But I think it's really relevant. Um, you know, I, I just, just this past... I mean, Friday, I think, we had what? We had um, Black Friday, and then we have, you know, something, Cyber Monday, and I don't know if you do this, but with your families, you know, you, I, we have grandchildren, and I kind of decide how much money we want to spend on each grandchild and how much for each family. We don't want to buy too much for somebody or too little for somebody else. Do you do that? Do you add it up and think, all right, this is what I can allocate for this? It's all about money in that case. Um, and even this time of year, it's kind of, it, it's kind of unusual. Do you know we have 325 days between now, today, and the presidential election? 325 days. So we have 325 days where we're going to be able to listen to people talk to us about mainly the mo your money, economy. I mean, some people will say, listen, I think it's best we tax you more so we can allocate to the public. And then there'll be some that will say, no, we need to get more into the hands of the people so they can handle their own money. I, I don't really care what side you are on. I'm sure there's value in both arguments. Uh, but it has to do with money. It causes me to pause for a second. And I ask this question. What does God say about all this? What's God's answer to this? And when I'm trying to look for an answer what God says, I like to turn to Scripture. Um, 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 6, 1 through 6, um, Solomon states, I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on men. God gives a man wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing his heart desires. But God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place? This can be confusing. When I read it, I first read it, I, I know I got, I got two things out of it. First, that what my wealth, my possessions, have been given to me by God. It was a gift from God. And I have obligations there. The second thing it tells me is that I came into this world with nothing and I'm leaving this world with nothing. I mean my pockets are, my pop pockets are just as empty when I arrive as when I leave. So I have this space here to work within. First Timothy, when, um, when Paul was um, trying to coach his mentor E, Timothy, uh, when, he, when Timothy was the leader of the church, had this to say about, about money. But godliness and contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, but we can take nothing out of it. Again, the same theme. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich will fall into temptation and trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So is it wealth, or is it the love of wealth? Is our possessions truly a gift from God? And if yes, should we be good care caretakers of them? And at what point does this become wrong? It sometimes seems like it's never enough. Rockefeller was asked once, how much money do you need? He answered, a little more than I have today. I find that interesting. You see, I've managed money for people throughout many years. I have made decisions and given advice that I know have created great wealth with people. And I gotta ask myself, am, am I no more than a tax collector? Am I no more than the thief in the night? Is, is, is that the line that I have created for myself? I think what it is is this. It's the degree of importance I put on something. And when that degree gets too important, I think I may have crossed the line. Every in the, most people in this room have a job. You make some money. You have a retirement plan, live in a home that you should be pr proud of. So when does money become the root of evil? When have we crossed the line? And that's what I want to talk about. Bob Buford wrote a book. It's called Halftime. This book portrays life as an athletic event. And in an athletic event, we play the first half. And then we go into the locker room, 
and discuss what we did in the first half, what we did right, what we did wrong, what we need to change. So when we go and play the second half, we can end this contest victoriously. We tweak and change. This is our halftime. We are in the locker room right now. Here we are. So let's talk about this. Let's reflect a little bit on the first half. Um, years ago, when I was managing Merrill Lynch, headquartering it here out of Chattanooga, uh, uh, Bob Corker came to me. He was the mayor at that time, later to become a senator. He, he asked me, he said, John, would you mind sponsoring wine over water? Now, I don't know if you've heard of that before. Uh, what it is, I, I think, I don't know, I guess they still do it. I haven't been to it in years, I, do they? I, I, I don't know, you, they, they sell tickets to it. You know, you pay 50 bucks and you walk across the Market Street Bridge and you drink this wine and eat this food and they collect the money up and, and it was, it was to, uh, the, the money was supposed to go to developing the downtown. But here's the real secret. Here's what really happens at that event. The night before at the convention center, they have this big party. That's where the good wine is. That's where the good food is. And they gave me a couple hundred tickets and I could, I handed it out to my employees and they, they gave them to their best clients and they went into the convention center and we had a grand time. I walked through and everybody was patting me on the back. Great job, John. Boy, are you a philanthropist. Thanks for doing this. Everybody wanted to be my new best friend. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, I have no idea where that money went that I gave. None. I have no idea what it improved upon. I could have done some things. I could have, I, I could have approached the other financial leaders in this community and said, hey, let's get together. Let's, let's throw more money in the pot. And let, let's really make a difference. We could have coached young entrepreneurs that were starting businesses to help them flourish and grow and be better and improve our community. I could have gone to the YMCA and said, you know, let's, let's get the youth in here. Let's get these young adults in here. Let's, let's see what we can do to help them contribute and teach them to be great citizens in our community. No, that did not happen. What a missed opportunity. I just blew it. But I'm living in the first half. And now we're in the locker room. And now we're going to talk about it. Oh, other institutions have done the same thing. Um, when I was at West Point, 1971, IBM had this mainframe computer in there. It was as big as one of your classrooms. It was huge. And boy, was it fast. It was so quick. I could take my data cards, drop them off at night, and, you know, pick them up the next morning. All processed. So quick. Most of the time, it would point, in an error, point out an error that I made, so I'd have to just do the same thing that night. Well, IBM had a purpose. They had a reason for being. Their purpose was to build the best mainframe computer in the world and sell more than any of them. And they did. They were selling mainframe computers after nobody really wanted mainframe computers. And they had to force themselves to reinventing themselves. Their stock dropped from over $100 a share to $10 a share, and it stayed there for 20 years. That was their purpose, mainframe computers. What is your purpose? There's another company by the name of Merck, a drug company. They've had their problems, don't get me wrong. But their purpose, reason for existing, is to rid the world of disease. That's their reason for being. So as long as there is disease in this world, they have a purpose. And they're still living that purpose. I oftentimes ask, oftentimes ask myself, am I building mainframe computers? Or am I ridding the world of disease? And ladies and gentlemen, I was involved in the financial industry in 2008. I know what was going on there. 
Now, the reason why our financial system almost imploded, the straw that broke the camel's back, certainly was bad loans. And it was poor investing. But that wasn't the reason. The reason why we almost was imploded was because of greed. That's why. What's yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. And it was a prevailing breeze that flowed through that industry. And it corrupted. But now we're entering the second half. Now we reflect on those things. And I want you to think about this. Look at it like this. I have three bricklayers. And these three bricklayers are building brick walls. And I go up to the first bricklayer and I ask, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a brick wall. I go to the second bricklayer and I ask, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a church. I go to the third bricklayer and ask, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building the house of God. Three bricklayers doing exactly the same thing for very different reasons. One's the first half, one's the second half. Um, there is a monastery in South Carolina uh, that's been written about. The, the title of the book that was written was The Business Practices of the Trappist Monks. The Mumkin uh, Monastery in South Carolina. <clears throat> and here's what they do. Here's what they did. They had, what they would do is they'd bring businessmen into their monastery and they would live and practice in there and they had a very successful egg business. They had chickens and they had an extremely well known in that part of the country. People would come from all over, you know, grocery stores and stuff to buy their eggs, uh, paid premium price for it, very profitable, made a lot of money doing this. And they were teaching business people how to employ Christian practices in business. It was good for business. One day they walked outside and there was a bunch of people with signs. Cruelty to chickens. Treating chickens bad. And there was a national movement. And I don't know if they were or not. I don't think so, but I don't know. So the monks went inside and they say, what will we do? And here's what they decided. They decided we're going to get out of the chicken business. We're gonna, they sold all their chickens. They totally got out of the business, the chicken business, walked away from that business, very profitable, and then started making fertilizer and growing mushrooms. That business became more successful than the chicken business. You see, it had nothing to do with chickens or mushrooms or fertilizer. It had everything to do with injecting Christ into the business community. And it happened to be good for business. I think that the most powerful group in our country is the family. I think the family is extremely important to the survival of our country. And so it's fair for me to ask you What's the purpose of your family? What half is your family in, first or second? I can tell you, you know, I, gee whiz, I, I, I walked around getting up, going to work, doing what I had to do, tried to go as many ball games as I could, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but I had a job to do, and I get it. But in 2000, unexpectedly, um, no history, my wife, Carol, dropped out of a heart attack. Angela was 19, Katie was 16, my two daughters. I got back from a business trip, went to the home that evening, a lot of people there, got some sleep, I guess, I don't know, went early the next morning out, we're in the foyer of our home. Katie and I were hugging each other, Katie, my youngest, Angela walks in. Now, Angela's the one who's rooted. Angela, clear-eyed. Angela walks up to us, 
throws her arms around us and says these words. We are going to serve as an example as to how a Christian family behaves in crisis. We're going to church. Went to this little Lutheran church over here I happened to be president of at the time. Walked into the church service late. It wasn't a church service. It was an organizational meeting for a large funeral that was about ready to take place. You know, who's going to hand out the ham sandwiches, bulletins, you know, the stuff that goes into. We walk in, everybody looks at us, and then gets back to work. We leave before it's over. It was too early for the I'm sorry's, and I mean, what do you say? <clears throat> we go back home. Several months after that, a young lady in the church, 16 years old, gives a youth sermon. And she says this. She goes, a few weeks ago, on a Friday, I learned that I flunked algebra. My boyfriend broke up with me. And I got cut from the cross-country team all in the same day. And my parents were very mad at me. And I began to think, this isn't worth it. And suicide was on the table. But I remember my friend Katie walking in that church the day after her mother died. If she could do that, I can do this. And we've started changing the world. Years later, yesterday, yesterday, we had a disaster in this country. We had a man go into a classroom in Pensacola, Florida and start a firefight killing three people. If you watch the news, you know all about it. Well, my son uh, is an instructor, married Katie, and he goes to that classroom every single day. Except yesterday, he was scheduled to show up at 8 o'clock, and the firefight started at 7.30. He was there at 6 in the morning the morning before. So I talked to him, you know, middle of, middle of the morning, find out how he's doing. We had a conversation, and he says to me, don't worry, John, we're going to serve as an example as to how a Christian family behaves in crisis. We're going to change the world. And there'll be years will pass by, and I'll have a grandchild call their parents, and they'll have children that'll call their parents, and they'll say, don't worry, Dad, don't worry, Mom. We're going to serve as an example, dot, dot, dot. We can change the world. That has nothing about money but everything about it. Because if we're, if we're going to move into this second half, we've got to use those gifts that the Father has given us to really realize our purpose. We have to educate our children and you have to save for that. I want people to prepare for retirement and dignity. That's just fine. That's modeling something that is important. When you get those retirement statements, and don't throw them away. Know what they mean. It's important. If you don't know what they mean or can't do it, find somebody who can help you with that. Take vacations. You need a break. Have respectable homes so when you go in, you're comfortable. And you can think about how you're going to realize your purpose and explode the next day using these resources that have been gifts given to you. But as soon as we start measuring the value of a Christ-created human being is something less than others because of things, we begin to lose perspective. So, I want to I, I want to conclude this with um, real financial advice here. I'm going to really give you some advice for your money. Be good custodians of those gifts. I'm not going to apologize for them. You be good. I want your business to grow. I want you to be successful. I want you to aspire and have dreams. I want you to keep perspective. 
To help you keep perspective, here's another good piece of financial advice, and I take this from Scripture, Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Try this for a year, ladies and gentlemen. Try, here's the card. This is on my desk, okay? It reads, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Do those things. Don't worry about your money. It'll be just fine. Amen.